Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is Ohm's Law and Electrical Safety. Our objective is to apply Ohm's Law to scenarios involving electrical safety. Additionally, we'll discuss safe work practices when performing electrical work. This lecture does not cover circuit protection devices like fuses, breakers, and ground fault current interrupters, nor does it cover grounding and bonding. These topics, also related to electrical safety, will be addressed in later lectures. This topic is an extension of the General Industrial Safety Lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, only dim or recall its contents, by all means take the time to do so now. The same caveats I gave during the General Industrial Safety Lecture apply to this one as well. The topic of electrical safety is far too important and far too large to be covered in a single online lecture. If you are seeking formal safety certification, I recommend you visit your local community college or a reputable and recognized service provider. This lecture's only purpose is to provide general electrical safety guidance and gives us a chance to apply Ohm's Law to these scenarios. My intention is that you understand, appreciate, and respect electricity, not fear it. It is as dangerous as it is useful, and there are laws, natural and man-made, that govern its wise use. If you've been following this playlist in its intended sequence, you may be shocked, pardon the pun, to find a lecture on electrical safety appear so late in our discussion. Customarily, safety is the first chapter of most textbooks, and presented in such a sequence implies high priority. This is the wrong way to do it, because electrical safety is absolute nonsense without an understanding of Ohm's Law. It is my intention that this series provide you with a progressively expanding skill set that will allow you to apply previously obtained knowledge to an ever-growing pool of applications. Today, we'll use our newfound understanding of Ohm's Law to understand electrical safety. For those with an understanding of Ohm's Law, a saltwater-soaked person standing on a metal platform touching a bare high-voltage wire is an obvious recipe for disaster. This is all kinds of dumb, and your newfound appreciation for Ohm's Law tells you so for several compelling reasons. First, everything is a conductor. However, some conductors are better than others. A saltwater-soaked person is an especially good conductor with low resistance. Second, a metal platform is also a low-resistance conductive path connected to Earth, something we often use as a reference for voltage measurements. Third, the wire is high voltage. The magnitude of this voltage is often made with reference to ground, that same plane the worker is connected to via the metal platform. If the worker touches the wire, there is a high voltage differential across a low-resistance path and substantial current will flow. The magnitude of this current via Ohm's law is directly proportional to voltage and inversely proportional to resistance. If the voltage is high and the resistance is low, the current will be extremely high. Let's take the simple analysis one step further and look at it from the perspective of power and energy. With both high voltage and high current, the power transferred to this worker is high because power equals voltage times current. If energy is power times time, if the conductive path is sustained for a long time, the energy delivered to the electrocuted worker will be high. Customarily, I have been speaking about energy as if it was a force applied for a distance, because the joule, the SI unit of energy, can be represented as a newton of force expressed for a distance of one meter. However, different forms of energy exist, in this case, notably thermal. Depending upon your choice of units, joules of energy could be equated to either a BTU or a large calorie where a BTU is the heat energy necessary to raise the temperature of a pound of water one degree Fahrenheit, and a large calorie is the heat energy necessary to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water one degree Celsius. One BTU is equal to about 1,055 joules, and one large calorie is equal to about 4,186.8 joules. Water heat's nonlinear, and there are a bunch of different other considerations, but let's just say these are pretty close figures. The point being that electrical energy can be changed into heat energy, and this, among other deleterious effects, is what makes high current flowing through your body a situation to be generally avoided. Given an understanding of Ohm's law, and power, and energy calculations, think about the simple steps you need to take to avoid inadvertent transfer of energy, i.e. a shock, when working on an electrical system. Step one, avoid high voltage. If voltage is high, current will be high. Here's an even better idea. Avoid voltage altogether. Turn it off, lock it out, tag it out, and test it. Verify that all sources of hazardous energy are removed, 
If you don't have to work on energized equipment, don't do it and turn it off. Lock it out and tag it out. Step two, don't be a low resistance path. An insulator needs to be between you and high voltage sources. Make sure your listed personal protective equipment is dry and passes daily inspection. A common piece of personal protective equipment associated with electrical work are rubber gloves. Rubber has a high resistance. Rubber is an insulator. Current through high resistance paths should be low. Step three, if all else fails, don't get shocked for long. If energy is power times time, the longer you are a conductive path, the more energy will be transferred to you. It is for this reason systems often incorporate protective mechanisms such as fuses and ground fault current interrupters to limit the length of high current or fault current events. We'll examine these devices in later lectures. Step four, follow the law. This is probably the one and only time in this lecture series I'm not referring to Ohm's law. I'm saying follow the appropriate laws governing safe work practices. There is absolutely no reason for you to ever be exposed to high voltage while you are a path of low resistance for an extended period of time. There are mandatory laws and safe work practices established by governing bodies, specifically OSHA and the NEC or National Electrical Code established by the NFPA. Obey the law. It's there to protect you. Finally, step zero, meaning before all these other considerations even come into play, know what you're doing. Don't just flip switches and push buttons. You are going to get yourself or someone else killed. A lot of industrial accidents aren't caused by reckless or careless people. Some accidents are caused by well-meaning people simply lacking the knowledge to do the job they've been pressured into doing. Don't do things you don't understand. I am more than willing to admit there are things that I can't do or don't understand, like listen or care about people's feelings or any of that other made up stuff. I just don't do those things well and I am not going to pretend I do. If you're being pressured into doing something you don't understand, don't do it until you're absolutely clear that no one's going to get hurt. People's lives might be on the line and one of those lives might be yours. Here are some general safe work practices you should follow in working with electricity. Never work alone. If your team is working remotely, stay in contact with your operations and maintenance organization using radios. Turn the power off. Certain measurements must be made with the power on, but if all possible, turn it off when connecting instrumentation, then turn it back on to make the measurement. Never modify a circuit with the power running. You could accidentally short circuit critical current controlling elements. This is especially important when incorporating ammeters into a system. High power circuits need to make and break connection using devices rated to make and break that high current. Discharge or lock out any electrical energy storage elements like batteries or capacitors. Even if this system is unplugged, such energy storage devices can energize this system. Know where the emergency off button is. Have an exit plan. Have three exit plans and know where the fire extinguisher is. A fire extinguisher isn't there to put out fires, but rather clear a path to one of your exits. Use personal protective equipment, including safety glasses. Remove conductive jewelry like rings, and if you got long hair, tie it up out of the way. Never, ever wear a tie or a scarf around rotating mechanical equipment. Matter of fact, never wear a tie ever. Insulate your body. Use tools with insulated handles and don't become part of a conductive path. If at all possible, work one-handed and maintain clearance by not leaning on other parts of the equipment. This ensures the conductive bridge isn't formed through your body. Before we move on to the rest of this lecture, let's get this out of the way. There is this saying that it's not the voltage that kills... I just can't even finish it. It's so stupid. You know what I'm saying. If you don't know what I'm saying, just let it be. Trust me, you're better off. The statement is stupid because without voltage, charges won't move. This is like saying it's not the gun that kills you, it's the bullet. Listen, you can take a 62 grain M855A1 5.56 millimeter enhanced performance round with a solid copper core and a steel penetrator tip and chuck it at a brick wall as hard as you possibly can. But after a couple tries, you realize maybe using an M4 carbine might yield better results. The rifle makes the bullet move. Voltage makes current move. The bullet won't move without the rifle firing it. Similarly, current won't move without voltage. 
high voltage will kill you because high voltage causes high current and low resistance paths. This being said, there are distinct levels of unpleasantness associated with increasing levels of current. To further complicate matters, quite like eating a pepper is distinctly different from getting blasted in the face with pepper spray, there are areas of the human body that are notably more vulnerable to current than others. The human heart has this thing in it called the sinoatrial node, which is tissue that regularly generates electrical impulses that serves to regulate the pumping action of the heart. It's the pacemaker of the heart. If the SA node is taken out or goes into random firing, something called AFib, the heart can't pump blood and you die. Long story short, if current has to travel through your body, make sure it doesn't go through your heart, your head, your genitals, or anything else you use often or really enjoy using when you get the chance. As a general rule, don't get electrocuted anywhere because it hurts. It hurts when 2 milliampers of current is traveling through you, and it really hurts at around 8 milliampers. You're taking some serious damage at 30 milliampers, and you might have difficulty breathing at around 50 milliampers. Your heart's going to stop pumping at like 150 milliampers, and you're burning at like 300 milliampers. The small magnitudes of these current levels and their associated unpleasantness might seem surprising to you. Consider a 100 watt light bulb driven by a 120 volt source. An application of the power equation demonstrates this light bulb draws roughly 833 milliampers of current. Similarly, consider a 900 watt toaster also driven by a 120 volt source. Another application of the power equation demonstrates this toaster draws roughly 7.5 amps of current. Aren't these incredibly high currents using our existing scale of undesirable effects? 833 milliampers is not even on this chart, let alone 7.5 amps or 7,500 milliampers. True, but guess what? You're not a light bulb and you're not a toaster. What's the resistance of a 100 watt light bulb that draws 833 milliampers when hooked to a 120 volt source? An application of Ohm's law demonstrates the 100 watt bulb has a resistance of 144 ohms. Similarly, what's the resistance of a 900 watt toaster that draws 7.5 amps when hooked to a 120 volt source? Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates the toaster has a resistance of 16 ohms. This begs the question, what's the resistance of the human body? The answer is, it depends. It depends upon the path taken by the current. It could go from arm to arm, arm to foot, head to foot, or any other combination. Not only does it depend upon the path, it also depends upon the nature of the tissue it passes through. The human body, quite like a circle, has two sides an inside and an outside. Really, I never get tired of that joke. Anyways, all the gooey, bloody, squishy stuff on the inside has pretty low resistance, but it's normally wrapped in high resistance, dry skin. Wet or sweaty skin, however, has a relatively low resistance. Broken skin is also low resistance, and as if being electrocuted wasn't bad enough, now you're bleeding. Let's say I take a resistance measurement of my dry skin and the ohmmeter reads 400 kilo ohms. Then, suppose I go out in the garage, tape a picture of your lazy lab partner to a punching bag, and then viciously pummel that punching bag for a solid hour before I take another resistance reading. Returning in a far better mood, I'd most likely find the resistance reading for the same path has dramatically decreased to, let's say, 9 kilo ohms, 44 times less than previously, just because I'm covered in an electrically conductive film. By the way, everyone's body composition is different, and it varies from day to day. So if you observe different values for your own body, don't think you're sick or special. Using your newfound understanding of Ohm's law, see if you can answer the following questions. One, see if you can determine the voltage necessary to produce a mild shock of two milliampers for both dry and wet skin conditions. Two, see if you can determine the voltage necessary to produce a more painful shock of eight milliampers for both dry and wet skin conditions. And finally, three, see if you can determine the current produced if I was to make direct contact with 120 volts for both dry and wet skin conditions, and what deleterious effects might I notice? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Voltage is current times resistance. Substituting our given values for the dry skin condition demonstrates that it would take 200 volts to generate a mild shock of two milliampers. In the lower resistance wet skin condition, Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates that it would take a much smaller 18 volts to generate the same mild shock. Similarly, another application of Ohm's law demonstrates that it would take 3,200 volts or 3.2 kilovolts to generate a more painful shock of 8 milliampers. 
and the low resistance wet skin condition, another application of Ohm's law demonstrates that it will only take 72 volts to generate the same more powerful shock. Finally, another application of Ohm's law demonstrates that current is voltage over resistance. Substituting our given values for the dry skin condition demonstrates that a 120 volt source would generate only 300 microamperes or 0.3 milliamperes of current, well below the threshold of a mild shock. You know you've been hit, but probably not enough to be dangerous. Similarly for the wet skin condition, Ohm's law demonstrates that a 120 volt source would generate approximately 13.3 milliamperes of current, somewhere between very painful and taking serious damage. You will definitely know you've been hit. Now compare and contrast the dry and wet skin conditions. In all scenarios, the low resistance wet skin condition is synonymous with higher, more damaging levels of current. This is why electrical safety is of such critical concern in areas associated with water, like kitchens, bathrooms, and showers. The moral of this example problem is this. If you are going to die wet and naked, make sure it's not electricity that kills you. Let's talk about other dangers associated with electricity. Beyond electrocution hazards, there exist dangers associated with arc flashes. An arc flash is exactly like a lightning bolt, and temperatures can briefly exceed that of the sun. An arc flash can burn an inadequately protected worker, and if that wasn't enough, any surrounding material exposed in an arc flash is vaporized and violently expelled outwards. Arc flashes can occur during high voltage switching operations, and such operations are always associated with an increased level of personal protective equipment and safety precautions. Additionally, be aware that the different flavors of electricity, DC versus AC, have their own unique safety concerns. DC stands for direct current, i.e. it does not change polarity nor direction. A DC shock may often be associated with a rapid muscular contraction, meaning that a limb touching an exposed conductor may involuntarily retract and may break the connection sparing further damage. AC, not so much. AC stands for alternating current meaning electricity that changes magnitude and polarity many times a second. Contact with an exposed AC conductor often results in muscular spasms, and these spasms can prolong the exposure time. If a coworker is being electrocuted, do not touch them until you can turn off the power safely, lest you become part of the circuit. The injured coworker then needs to be tended by an individual trained in first aid, CPR, and AED. An AED, by the way, is a device that kickstarts the heart's SA node back into a regular cyclic firing, ironically enough, using a timed and measured quantity of electrical energy. Again, electricity has the capacity for both life and death. Don't fear it, understand it, and respect it. All right, that's about it. Before we go, I need to make one thing perfectly clear. I am not an electrician, and you cannot use anything you learn from this or any other lecture as professional electrical advice. Follow the rules. Follow the code. It's there for a reason, to safeguard people and property from electrical and fire hazards. This content has been developed for edification only. While reasonable care has been exercised with respect to its accuracy, I assume no responsibility for errors, omissions, or suitability for any application or misapplication of its contents. This material cannot, will not, and never makes the claim to take the place of personalized guidance in a safe and supportive lab environment. At most, this content serves as a bare minimum requirement to even enter a lab. Get in touch with your local community college and see if they offer courses with associated hardware labs. In conclusion, this lecture took a quick look at Ohm's Law applied to electrical safety. We discussed electrocution dangers and arc flashes. Additionally, we briefly discussed safe work practices when working with electricity. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.